July 25th, Monday, and it is episode number 657 of Let There Be Talk. Welcome to the show, brought to you by my podcast network, cactusradionetwork.com. You can get all of my podcasts absolutely free in one spot. You don't have to go anywhere else. You can go to cactusradionetwork.com. You can get the grail and Let There Be Talk. And the now um, uh, classic Dark Fonzies. So, check all that out. Welcome aboard. Glad you guys are here. Thanks for joining me. I want to say thank you to the Patreoners out there. We've been having a good time on Patreon doing Zooms every week. And I just dropped a bonus episode of Let There Be Talk on the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. Help support the podcast. It... uh, It helps big time. Tyler Jones just joined up. Thank you so much, Tyler Jones, for joining the Patreon. And I hope to see some more of you out there. I've been putting up uh, some of the full interviews, uh, the video versions of them on Zoom. So you can find that on there. And uh, over 100-something bonus episodes. Okay, guest today. You know where the pro drummers go? to learn to play, uh, uh, what is that called? A rigonomically better, uh, you know, body posture and figure out how to play the drums. They go to this man. Not only is he a professional drummer, but he also teaches the pros, gets them out of their bad habits, hunched over, uh, you know, bad bad drum kit setup, all of that. They all go to Dave Elich. I've been hearing this guy's name for years. I met him through Bill Burr. We became friends. We both love watches. We love cars and we love architecture. So boom, this is going to be a great episode because not only is it drums, it's all of the others uh, stuff that I love and he loves. So it was an honor to have him on. This man played in the Mars Volta, which is no joke. If you play in the Mars Volta, you know what you're doing on that drum kit. And uh, that is just the the Mars Volta, kind of like a modern day version of the Zappa band, where if somebody was in that band, they were somebody that was a monster on their instrument. And uh, he played with the Mars Volta. Then he did the anti-mask record, with uh, Cedric and Omar and Flea. We get into that, which is really cool to hear stories on recording that. We also uh, talk about his time with Weezer. He just did a run with Weezer around Europe. We talk about other great drummers, Dave Lombardo and uh, everybody out there. I, I give my shout out and love to uh, the great Lars Ulrich. I don't care what anybody says. I, I shout him out all the time. And I wish I was in a band with Lars. So, Dave, it was great to have you on, man. Really fucking cool. Dave loves comedy. And uh, we talk a little comedy. We go all over the board. He grew up in the Bay Area, Sebastopol. He is an Annaly High alumni. Up there in the land of Tom Waits and the great... Uh, uh, Les Claypool and uh, Zone Music, hilarious. Shout out to all those people. I want to give you a, a quick tip here. I got a bunch of Burr dates coming up. Bill Burr. I will be touring with Bill Burr. So check that out. Uh, some of the dates are on the website and some I just got. Let me read them off to you real quick and then we'll get into the show here. Uh, wah, 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 wah. Which, by the way, I am going to be selling three of Bill Burr's guitars. They are left-handed. I prefer to sell them in L.A. because I don't like to ship guitars. They are left-handed. Two are SGs. One is a American-made Strat in uh, Gold Mist. The SG, one of them is uh, Olympic White. And the other one is their Classic Cherry. And I will have more details on my Instagram, or you can uh, you can DM me on um, on uh, Instagram. I'm fucking losing it here for a minute because I'm looking up three fucking things at the same time like an idiot. 
Okay. Yes. So a couple of three guitars of bills I'm selling. Here are some of the dates I'm doing with Bill. 825 Reading, Pennsylvania. 826 Buffalo, New York. Uh, December 8th, Nampa, Idaho. Oh, God. I'm looking forward to going there. That'll be great. Salt Lake City. I'll finally be there December 9th since that fucking club never books me. So that'll be cool. Go in there and do the goddamn arena. Take care of that. <laughs> December 10th, Colorado Springs. So those are some of the bird dates. And then, of course, the great Youngblood tour I will be on from September 8th to October 28th with Marcus King and Neil Francis. This is just a fucking great way to close out the end of the year here. Doing comedy and uh, making people laugh. It's, that's all I want to do. That is all I want to do. All the tour dates are on deandelray.com, including merch. There's been a restock on the merch. We've got the cool Gertie hoodies and Gertie sweatshirts and the Perry Shawl t-shirt. That's a, a collab I did with them, the Rock Dean Del Rey shirt. Okay. That's some of that stuff out of the way. And uh, I, I, what else? What else I got here? Oh, yeah. Shit. Almost forgot this. I do not want to forget this. I don't know what is happening with you guys right now, but uh, I will tell you this, man. The world is fucking insane. I don't know how it got this insane. It is just fucking, it, it'll just rattle your cage, man. I have lost some friends to uh, bad doses of depression and stuff boiling in their minds, and mine also, mine also. And I'm constantly trying to seek help and uh, figure it out with all different things that I'm doing with exercise, and uh, what better way than to talk to somebody? Better help, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P. Better help is unbelievable. Special offer for my listeners, 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash Delray. That's 10% off your first month of online therapy at betterhelp.com slash Delray, D-E-L-R-A-Y. I'm telling you, man, this stuff helps. You need to find somebody to talk to, and this will definitely help you out, man. Therapy is cool. People, you know, I remember growing up, men didn't get therapy. I'm, 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 I'm a man. I, don't, I, don't, I, fucking, I work through my stuff, man. I'm a man. I don't cry. I don't, I don't go to therapy. But hey, man, do yourself a favor. This will definitely help, and you can just do it right in your own home. You cannot go wrong. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional therapy done securely online, available to everyone worldwide. Really easy. You can just log into your account anytime, send a message to your therapist, and bam, it's happening. Do it, man. I know it is tough out there. We need, to, we need to talk to people and just figure it out. It's 10% off first month online therapy at betterhelp.com slash Del Rey. All right, everybody. I love you. Have a great week. I will be doing comedy around town at the Comedy Store and, uh, and other clubs around town. I'll be posting up on that this week. Just doing some shows around town before I uh, get back out on that road. On the road again. I just can't wait to get on the road again. Ah, great Willie Nelson. Love that guy. Still alive. Still on stage. That's what I want to do. Be on stage until I die. Unless I had Willie's money. Then I would just be chilling in Toto Santos. With Gertie and an electric dirt bike. Looking at the waves. Eating fresh fish. Until next week, my friends, here he is, Dave Elich. 
All right, here we are, another episode of Let There Be Talk. I, I should just change the name of the show to Let There Be Drum Talk. No one has had the amount of fucking great legendary drummers, no one more than me, and I'm tooting my own fucking horn, and uh, I love to have drummers on because they do not get the glory they deserve. And uh, great drummer today. Introduce yourself, my man. This is Dave Elich. Happy to be here, buddy. Yeah, man. We're trying to get you on for uh, a, a couple lo- years, maybe yeah. three years. Yeah, yeah. Lo- no, longer than that. I yeah. think we were talking when I was doing the anti mask. Yeah. Thing that was like 2014, 2015. Is that how long ago that was already? Yeah. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> it's insane. That was a fucking great band. Yeah, thanks. It was it was fun. It was fun while it lasted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those guys are geniuses. They're uh, they're definitely talented. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll give you that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, you know, no matter what, they have made some of the most original music that I've heard in the last twenty five years. Sure. I well, mean. You know, the running, I mean, when I was doing Volta, like the running joke in that band is, uh, you know, people go, love your first two albums, you know, because I think the first record is like a masterpiece. Yeah. Um, and the second record, there's some great songs on. And, and then it just, and then it got a little out there, but. But that's what I like. Well, I liked when they got out there. Sure. And that's fine. It's just, you're going to alienate a certain amount of people, which is fine. Um, but it's like, you know, the amount of records that like not comparing them to Zappa or Miles, but like they would put out everything. Yeah. And there were certain records where it's like, all right, well, that kind of didn't really work. And then other other records, it worked. But the 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 I think you posted that Zappa thing this morning that I yep. that I reposted about him saying like all the record execs back in the days were like cigar chomping old dudes who were just like, I don't know, I don't know what this is, but let's put it out. Yeah, they took chances. Yeah, and that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. You know? So well, that's so- why I love uh, those two guys because they will take chances. And it's so rare that people will not steer off of what's popular that might, you know, hit their pocketbook right. or their popularity. Right. And they just will not do it. Right. And, um, well, with that anti mask thing, I hadn't talked to those guys in years. And then one day, like, they, Cedric just called me out of the blue and, and was just like, hey, I'm doing this new, this new thing with Omar. And, it's kind of like garage rock punk shit. And we didn't, you know, think you got like the sort of chance you deserved in Volta. So like, you know, do you want to do it? And I was like, yeah, fuck it. Sure. You know? And, and so it was just, it was just kind of, I don't know. We just got in the studio and wrote a bunch of stuff and flea came in and just like, never heard any of the music and just like played bass on it and just destroyed. I was yeah. just sitting there laughing the whole time. She was just ripping so hard, like never heard any of the music, just like destroying. It was hard to like leave the room. Cause I was just like laughing. Cause I was like, this is absurd. <laughs> yeah. He was ripping. Yeah. So yeah, it was, um, it was cool, man. It was, it was, it was fun. And it was, uh, I've done so many hired gun, like mercenary situations. It's, it's nice to, it was nice to be able to come up with my own parts yeah, and right, not right. Play yeah, not playing somebody else's yeah, parts. Yeah. Which is fine if you're in those situations. But yeah, I mean, I haven't had as many situations where I would have liked to play my own original stuff, you know. You played the Palladium gig I was at with Volta. No, that wasn't no? me. Who was no, that? I don't know. I mean, it, it, I only played with them for about a year, 2009, 2010, and we did a European run. Oh, I saw the footage of that. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And then yeah, you had crazy hair. Yeah, I had a huge afro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Happened to work out with the with the with the timing with that. Yeah. Yeah, and then we did an Australia run, Big Day Out, which there's a drum cam video of me playing that tour, which is actually how I met Burr. Yeah. Because uh, he saw that video and. And, uh, and then we connected on Twitter and then we became, you know, good friends. Um, and then I did a couple shows opening for Rage Against the Machine in South America with them. And, and that was it. It was, a, it was like a year. So, yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah, like I said, those guys are, uh, to me, they're, they're, they're some art geniuses there. Sure. And they got the vault to back. So yep. I don't know who's in the band. Um, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really in yeah. that scene anymore. So I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll see. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't get to see it. I mean, you know, it, good for me. I'm going to be on a tour. Great. But also bad for me. <laughs> you know, like, Damn it. I want to see that. Yeah, that's what YouTube's for, right? <laughs> now, here's something interesting I did not know. Did you go to Annalee High? <laughs> I did, yeah. I saw Sebastopol, 
And immediately I was like, oh, Annalie. Because I remember we played him in football. And it was like, oh, that's so funny, yeah. dude. So I just remember <laughs> Annalie High. And yep. of course, uh, that cool flea market up there. Yep. I yep. love the flea yeah. market. Dude, I haven't thought about that in years, right? Man. Yeah. And then there's a rib place that's on the side of 116 there. There's, there's a what? A rib place. Oh, that. Oh, yeah, totally, dude. 100%. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can't remember what it's called, but I know exactly what yeah, you're talking dude. about. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, Tom Waits and yep. Prairie Sun. Yep. Rest in peace. I yep. hear it's closing. Yeah, I think I'm it gonna is. I'm going to have Luca yeah. on here. Oh, cool. Quick. Yeah. Awesome. But um, yeah, and Les Claypool and Tom yeah. Waits and. Um, yeah, it was funny. Like, um, I mean, it was an amazing uh, place to grow up. My parents are both from the East Coast. So they were like, well, we don't want to have kids in New York. Or like, yeah. this is crazy. So they were like, well, we want to find this kind of idyllic place that's like growing up in the 50s in a sort of weird hippie version of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was an amazing place to grow up. And. You know, Spassful is like 7,000 people. It's at least when I grew up there. It was tiny. Right. But, um, you know, I was lucky enough. Annalie had like an amazing music program. Uh, Vance Regan was my was my high school band teacher. And he'd show up like at 530 in the morning. And we'd play like zero period jazz band. Like because the school didn't have a budget for it. And he's just like, well, I'll just show up before school starts. And Back when the teachers were cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, when they yeah. gave a shit, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, and then I went to Santa Rosa Junior College for like a year. And wow. Then I, yeah. And then I was like, all right, I got to get the fuck out of here because if I really want to do music for a living, it's not going to happen up here because the last I mean, it's funny. I've said this before, like, but you'll really get it. Like the last band that came out of the Bay Area, Primus, Metallica. Oh, uh, you know, you got a lot, man. You got Green Day. Green Day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, if you really think about it. I mean, it just depends what you think came out of it. I mean, there's so much, you know, you got to But when was like the last, the last, the last, the last band, uh, yeah, you know, like early nineties. Yeah. That's but, it. But, but you, uh, how old are you? 38. Th oh yeah. Shit. I'm 56. So <laughs> for me, yeah. I was seeing all the waves yeah. of music. You, so yeah. first you got the, you got the, uh, you know, I didn't see the dead and all that because right. I, I was uh, a baby, but. You know, you got the whole hippie scene, mm -hmm. and then and then you get into you know uh, Huey Lewis and Journey and Sammy Hagar and Your all Montrose, of, uh, yeah, yeah, and Pablo yeah, yeah. Cruz mm -hmm. and and all of that shit. Yep. You know, and then you get into the rock era of like Metallica and mm -hmm. you know Thrash and mm -hmm. and and and. And Testament mm -hmm. and Exodus mm -hmm. and and even um, the punk of like Dead Kennedys yep. and the Nuns and all this yep. stuff. So there was nonstop music until I think the first dot com hits. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. and that just destroys yep. the Bay Area for the history now yeah. all the way through. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. So like, I graduated high school in 2002. Oh yeah. So I looked. Oh, yeah, around. that's when I left yeah. here. Yeah. yeah, so I was like, I'm out of here. Exactly the same reason. Yeah. I, I, I luckily was paying attention and I was like, this shit's toast. I was like, this shit is done. And and even though I was still young, like I was already seeing the change in San Francisco. Now it's a completely different place oh, entirely. Completely. Yeah. There's no music no. scene there. No, you, know? you can't afford to do anything there. It's no. absurd. But, yeah. you know, growing up there was really cool. And Were you playing in cover bands? Yeah, I had I had friends um, like the Katati Cabaret and play, <laughs> playing there. It was uh, the Phoenix man. The Phoenix. Yeah. Oh fuck, Tom Gaffney yeah, had him exactly. on the podcast. Oh, amazing! That's guys awesome. a god. He's yeah. still there. Yep, still and, uh, running that. Place. The amount of times that place was like almost closing, man. The oh. fact that it's still there. So many bands have played that. Oh come that on, venue Primus shot their video. There. Yeah, fucking, Slipknot played yeah. there. Oh, like, everyone back in the day. Um, yeah, I played there a bunch when I was a kid, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I played in a bunch of cover bands, you know, and just f original bands for fun. And um, so it was funny, like when I when I was doing these Weezer shows recently, like we we were covering Enter Sandman and I sent it to a friend of mine from high school. And I was like, dude, like just how funny is this? Because we would be in his garage playing playing Enter Sandman and 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 probably Weezer songs and Pantera and stuff. 
And he was like, dude, this actually sounds pretty good. And then he's like, wait a second, this is you playing? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but like Weezer playing, playing it, playing Enter Sandman was pretty, yeah. pretty hilarious. Um, and those guys all met randomly in Petaluma. Weezer? Even, yeah, it's like a whole weird thing where it's like this guy knew this guy and this guy. And they randomly played like at the Phoenix, like really, really, really early on. Wow. But they all sort of came together up there too, even though that's not where they were from. It was really random. Yeah. I went to their uh, record release party. Uh, we played in LA. And then Scott Tunis from yeah. Zappa yeah. said, yeah, fucking load up your gear, man. And fucking let's go across town. We're going to the Monterey. Great band record release tonight. It was the Blue Route record. Oh wow! At the lingerie with the old configuration. Yeah. Went in there and watched them, and I was like, I'll never forget. It. They played that song in the garage. Yeah. And I was like, this is one of the best songs I've heard in a long time. I was like, what are these guys, man? They're like, they're like actually dressed as nerds. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah. they were dressed like the Revenge of the Nerds yeah, guys. Yeah, totally, totally. And, uh, you know, and uh, as much as I always say that Stevie Ray Vaughan era of Strat and a Hat, mm -hmm. I, I coined it when they came around, Sweater Rock. Because <laughs> yeah. it was like Nirvana, yep. Sweaters, yep. you know. Uh, yeah. Weezer sweaters, Beck sweaters, and sweater rock. <laughs> yeah. When they had, then they had sweater song. And they had the sweater song. Yeah. yeah. yeah on top of that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, what's funny is, um, uh, I think there's always that interesting juxtaposition between like what they look like and what the music sounds like as yeah. they've gone on. It's changed. But oh, hash pipe. I mean, it was yeah, completely yeah. different yeah. than anything. And then of course, Pinkerton, you mm -hmm. know, that's like the, uh, every band that has some kind of talk about, uh, a band that completely went somewhere else mm -hmm. uh, taking a risk mm -hmm. and the fans going, what the fuck? Well, from what my understanding was like when they did the blue album, they were all really on like a tight leash yeah, and it worked obviously. Oh yeah. Yeah. That album's, that album's a masterpiece. Yeah. Um, and then they self produced Pinkerton and we're like, all right, now we're going to do what we want to do. Yeah. And you know, it's, it is, it's a totally different thing because of that. You know, I don't even think the band does Coke, but to me, I would just <laughs> call, I would call it their cocaine era, <laughs> you know? And then, and then you got straight up kind of a Brian Wilson type of front man mm -hmm. who's like, you know, I'm not going to play rock. I'm going back to college for a while Yeah, and all kinds of crazy shit like yeah, that. He is rivers is one of the smartest dudes I've ever met. Yeah. He's, he's great. Yeah. He's really smart. Um, um, he's, uh, a lot of people misunderstand him because he's very, he's really quiet Yeah, and he always is like looking around and kind of seeing what's happening in the room and like, and I think a lot of people, uh, misinterpret that, but, uh, I was able to be like, oh, you're one of these guys, you know, pretty quickly. And I get along with people who are super smart, uh, pretty well. Cause I like, they're usually interesting. Uh, they read. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah. all you do is ask them what records and books and yep. films they like, and then you go, yeah. all right, cool. I'm not going to waste time over here. It'll be great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so we got, a, we hit it off immediately. We got, we got along really well. I, I really like him a lot. He's great. So you moved to LA. Is that what happens? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So this is sort of going totally, totally all over the place here. So but that's uh, what's great. Yeah. Well, whatever. Uh, so yeah. So I, I did the, JC for a year and was like playing in the big band and I was just like this is not going anywhere you know what am yeah, I what am I doing Jay Santa Rosa JC yeah, yeah I was like what am I doing this is <laughs> stupid um, but that was the deal is the JC is a great school so you go there and then you transfer somewhere else or whatever so I did a I did a five week performance program at Berkeley in Boston when I was seventeen because I was like oh you're supposed to go here or whatever and. I quickly realized that it didn't make any sense to go there or any other music school for that matter. It just didn't make sense for how expensive it was. Um, oh, because of the price? Yeah. And just, it. I don't care what school you're talking about. To me, the amount of money that you spend uh, these days, it's $70,000 a year to go to music school, whether it's Berkeley or USC or Juilliard or whatever. And you're 280 grand in the hole and yeah, then you get as out an of, artist and then you <laughs> get out of school and you play the spud for 30 bucks. Yeah. That math just doesn't add up. And, and I've gotten in, 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 you know, I've had a lot of teachers from these schools get really mad with me because I'm pretty vocal about this stuff, but it's really, um, they prey on these kids. 
yeah. these kids don't understand how debt works. So it's it's a it's a so I feel like someone has to go. Hey, hold on. Have you ever like gotten a credit card or leased a car or do you know how any of this shit works? Oh uh, yeah, no you know? one does. No, You're and like, then I'm just going to Berkeley. It's going to be great, and then I'll just get a, a band. Yeah. I'll be in a band and make tons of money. Yeah, no, sorry, no. And then they can't afford to play music anymore, which is yeah. tragic. So anyway, so I did that. I met a couple guys um, there. And um, James, this guitar player friend of mine, was like, hey, I'm going to USC for electrical engineering. And uh, and my buddy Leo, who, uh, you know Leo, Leo Nitzberg? Yeah. Yeah. So he lived in Petaluma. We went to like Hebrew school together. Wow. And I was like, hey, I'm moving to LA in two weeks. And he was like, I was like, you can kind of sing. Do you want to just sing in our band? And he's like, yeah, fuck it. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> living on a fucking chicken ranch in Petaluma. So we just moved down to LA together in 2003 and, and uh, me and Where, Leo. Where'd you guys land? Uh, like <clears throat> Bever- Beverly Hills adjacent. Oh, like, yeah. Like uh, Gregory Way and La Cienega. I always say adjacent means uh, the shitty next <laughs> neighborhood next to the one you wish you lived in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we moved here in, in 2003 and, and, uh, and yeah. Did uh, you have jobs, money? How did, how no, did... I mean, dude, I had, I had, I don't know, I don't know, like a couple grand to my name, you know, and um, I couldn't get a fucking job, man, to save my life. And so my dad ended up having to like call a friend of his and he got me a job at this armored transport company in Pasadena. What, just like, like armored cars? Yeah, Shit. but I was just like working in the office. Oh, I got you. Like his friend was like, I don't know, just like do some paperwork or something. I think he kind of pulled some strings or something because I just I just like, could not get a job. I mean, you know, like when I was in high school, I like, worked at a pizza place or something. Yeah. And I was also teaching lessons, so I didn't have any kind of a resume for like the real world, you know? Yeah, yeah. So well, like when, when musicians go to get jobs <laughs> after years and they go, it's like 20 years of here of no work. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> I sold weed and played bass. Exactly. We were chasing a dream. You know what I mean? You don't understand. Yeah. It's just a gap. Looks like you're in prison. <laughs> you know? You might be better off if you tell uh, them you're in prison. Than at least you had a, a, like a no mystery. <laughs> yeah, an excuse. Yeah. God. So, yeah. So, um, I got a job doing, do just, it was like office space, you know, it was like exactly the same thing. And, um, and I taught lessons on the side, taught kids and, and was going to Santa Monica college. And then I got an AA and, and then I got in this band called daughters of Mara that was on Virgin capital in 2003 or wait, sorry, 2005, six. And then, and so I was, you know, we were talking about two seconds ago. I was like, woo, I'm in a band on a major label. Like, and I had no idea how anything works. So I like, I was going up to, you know, Garth Richardson. Oh yeah. yeah. Garth. So we went up to Garth's place in, in Canada for three months to do this record. And I had no idea how anything works. So I was like, woo, I'm getting rid of my apartment. I'm going to be on tour. Yeah. And so I just got rid of my apartment and oh. cause I didn't know shit from you know my elbow so like i was like yeah i'm just gonna be on tour i guess after i do this record so we go and do this record for three young months. guy shit though. yeah that's you don't a, that's know you, do. you don't give a fuck yeah so so we do this record and then uh i go back to la and it's like okay it's supposed to come out and and uh and i'm sleeping on my friend's futon and then like eight months go by and then emi gets bought out by terra firma the old shelved record yep and then if you weren't Coldplay or whatever, you just got shelved. Yeah. So we got shelved. And uh, and then I was like, all right, well, shit, I got to figure something out here. So went back to went back to teaching. And um, I mean, I've been teaching since I was 15. It's like, you know, I'll, I'll always do it because I love doing it. So it wasn't like, oh, man, I got it was like, oh, OK, whatever. Well, it's great because you're your own boss. Yeah. I just it's a really rewarding thing to be doing. You and know? you get to play drums. And yeah, I mostly I don't play that much. I mostly talk when I'm right. teaching, you know, but it's just it's just being able to help get the, like the light go on in someone's eyes or brain is really is really rewarding experience i mean even when i was out on this reezer run i just did i was teaching when i had days off you know oh yeah um so yeah so um did that for a few years and then um and then i got the volta gig when i was like 25 how do you get that is there auditions or i mean you know because you're not out like playing your name's not in the mix even though it's funny when you google your name yeah people will be like hey no one ever talks about dave this guy's right. a monster like right. you're basically way under the the radar sure and um so how did that happen I think that's because I haven't been in a, a band, like an original band that's huge. You know, if you're right. a, if you're a hired gun, you only get like so 
But I mean, how'd you get into the mix of hired for Volta? Oh, sure. Um, it's all just word of mouth, you know. Um, Juan uh, Alderetti knew Garth. Yeah, and Juan, you know, there, there, there's another Bay Area yeah. Novato. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And a heavy uh, Prairie Sun uh, yep. superstar. Yep. Yeah, man. Paul totally. Gilbert. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Racer X, right? Yeah, yeah. Racer X. Um, but yeah, I, I uh, it was just word of mouth. I they got my name from a few different people, and uh, and they were call they were calling everyone, man. I mean, yeah. they called tons of fucking people because uh, they were scrambling. You know, uh, they had a few weeks to to find someone. Who and, left at that time? Who was the one that left? Uh, Thomas. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, you know, Juan came over um with you know jonathan hishke bass player who is it jonathan hishke he played bass in like um what has he done like uh he did like the shins for a while i don't and know him he's an amazing bass player um really good dude too anyway they just came over to my lockout and like he brought hishke over to like stare at me while i'm while juan's playing so he had like two sets of eyes which is pretty intimidating and so he was just like all right well um like do you know any of like the first record and i was like i i was like not really i just am like a fan of the record i've like listened to it a lot but i don't i've never like played anything and he's like well whatever let's just try this and so he's like okay that sounds good we'll try this and i'm just like winging it you know yeah. and he wanted to do that song elvia off of the right. second record right and we start playing and he, he stands up and goes holy shit like this sounds like theodore like this is fucking amazing like uh like because I was just playing pocket, you know? Like, yeah. And I don't think I sound like Theodore. I think he just, the guy who was in there previously did, let's just say, did not play very much pocket. <laughs> so I think he was just like, oh my God, this is what this is supposed to be, right, you know? Right, right, right. So once I, once I just did that, he was like, all right, I'm calling Omar. I'm going to go out the hall, in the hallway and call Omar, you know? And then he comes back in. He's like, all right, dude, like, do you want to do it? I was like, every, 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 every time I've ever had that situation where someone's like, all right, are you in? In my brain, I'm like, no, 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 no. And then I'm just like, yes. You ah, know? Like ah, every single ah, time. Ah, ah, ah. Every single time. Why would you say no to that though? Well, it's that, it's that, it's that, it's that thing of you go, oh God, I don't want to fuck this up. I don't oh, want to yeah. make any mistakes. This is a lot of pressure. You know, oh, all yeah. that, all and the that the records shit. are really complicated. Yeah. Very, really yeah. complicated. Yeah. It's very complex music. Um, there's a lot of pressure um, b just being in that band, you know, it's like doing Zappa or something. It's like the lineage is, is yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's, you know, you're stepping in some shoes, you know, it, it is as far as like a uh, level of players right. that came in and out also. Yeah. And the fans are very intense. Yep. Who's this guy? Yep, and, totally. and the music is complicated. Yep. And also, here you are. Is this going to be your first tour? That was my first real tour. Right. Yeah, I had done like regional stuff with my with my band Daughters of Mara, but nothing like real. Right. And so they, and I think there's, you know, I have to give them credit. Like, I think they like the idea of, of finding someone. Kind of like. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it worked for me. So, you know, I think like sort of, uh, you know, Miles would do that or, you oh, know, they'd Miles, find, yeah. find young people and bring them up. I mean, it's, you know, Bart Blakey, Max Roach, they would find these young cats and sort of be like, okay, like I'll put you through school in my band or whatever. Get on the cooker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they were just like, hey, you know, I was 25 and, and, uh, and so it's just like trial by fire. And, um, and the, me and Juan went down to Omar's place. He was living in Mexico at the time. And the three of us just like went through these songs and it was like, you know, two, two and a half hours worth of music. It was a lot of fucking music. Um, and I had like two weeks to learn it all. Wow. You know? Yeah, it was, it was gnarly. Um, and so I went down there and he was like, this all sounds great. Like, and you know, it's pretty gnarly to play that music without any vocals also. Oh, you know? yeah, because yeah. you don't know where you're yeah. at, man. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So, That's so fucking hard. It was really hard. No cues. Yeah, because I am very much like the vote. I'm always paying attention to the vocals. Yeah. So, yeah, so he was like, this sounds great. Like, okay. Like awesome. You know? And so, you know, we flew to Amsterdam and I met like the rest of the guys and we did a one run through the set and then that was it. And we were going. You wow. Know? Yeah. Wow. So, um, so yeah, I mean, they knew it was going to put me on the map and, um, and it did. Yeah. yeah. Totally, totally changed my life, you know? And, and at the time, like, I didn't know if I was in the band or if I was just there temporarily. Cause those guys are, let's say not the best communicators. 
Um, and th- to be fair, they might not have known what was happening at the time anyway. But but essentially, I you know, uh, from what I've understood, you know, they wanted to use this cat, DeAnthony Parks, um, for a while. Uh, and DeAnthony's incredible. I have a lot of respect for that dude. I think he's amazing. So in the grand scheme of things, like, I was just keeping seat warm, you know, and, yeah, and, and filling in. Yeah. Keep, keep that shit. Yeah. Yeah. It was just keep filling in. There. Yeah. So, you know, and that's, that's fine. I mean, there's, there's, uh, what I've liked to be in the band. I mean, at the time, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but, uh, retrospectively, I don't know, but, um, that's another story. But, um, anyway, so yeah, that put me on the map and, um, and then I think the next thing I'd, did after that was m83 oh yeah yeah same you know so a lot of these situations i've been in are like hey can you come in last minute so louis the drummer for that band was like a, a fan of mine at the time and he was like hey i got i can't do this these shows like i'd love to have you sub for me and so i was really paranoid at the time of being pigeonholed as some prog rock nerd m83 is like super simple oh. french yeah. synth pop music and that was right when midnight city was that single was huge and so i was like oh this is perfect like this is this is like exactly what i need right now and so you know did that that was great it was really fun and then ended up doing a bunch of soundtrack work with them later on and film score stuff which was fun and then I'm trying to remember here what what happened after that uh the 1975, same sort of thing. A lot of these guys I've subbed for, like Stacy with Miley Cyrus. I did that Bangers tour. Oh, that was what was next. I did that Bangers tour. Oh, wow. Yeah, with Miley in 2013, 14, right when Wrecking Ball came out. I did right. like Fallon. What was that like? That was amazing. I mean, yeah. they're running tracks and shit. Oh, yeah. Every, everyone runs tracks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, at least, at least a click, if not tracks. Are you the one triggering the tracks because that's a lot of pressure right yeah totally totally depends on the situation right um like there are certain situations where you do that yeah um and then there's a lot of times on these bigger gigs they'll have a playback person that's their job where they handle that and how does he do it is he is he got like headphones on and he's following? He's got a laptop on, or if not several, on the side of the stage, yeah. and um, and either there's some sort of cue that happens, like whether like it's the singer looking at him or like what the singer's saying. All right, here we go, and like hit, you know, he like hits space bar. Like I think a lot of times, a lot of times they'll just. Um, catch a flow after a while of because i remember when the drummer would cue it they were running radar sure which is which is the great you know yeah and so you know it's like you're just playing and then he would just hit a thing and it'd be like oh ah want to rock and roll yeah i don't know why i did kiss (laughs) but (laughs) but I remember that. And then once in a while, like the trigger wouldn't work. Yeah, or something. There'd yeah. be like no good background. <laughs> Just be like the, the real ones. <laughs> you know? But it yeah. was a lot of pressure on the drummer, man. Oh, there's a lot you of know? pressure. And they got all kinds of shit in their yeah. head going on the click and everything. Well, that's the thing people don't really understand is like, you can have a great singer. You need a great singer for, to have a great band, obviously, but you can't have a good band if you don't have a good drummer. Oh, I said, I said, you know? I said, show me a great band with a shitty drummer. Yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. It does not happen. But, you know, you'll never, you'll never get a singer or a guitar player to admit that to you, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even though they know. Well, they just, dumb. that's just dumb because, you know, every, look, I played music 25, I played music 25 <laughs> years. I like to rep- <laughs> remind people of that. Here he comes with that. But I've always said that, like, whenever a different drummer would come in for a different tour, uh, the feel would be completely different mm-hmm. and it, either worse or better. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like I, I played with this guy, Ronnie Crawford, was like one of the greatest drummers I ever played with. You know, he played in Lisa Lowe. And when he mm. came down, I was like, oh, Lisa Lowe. Right. This guy was like Bonzo meets Keith Moon. Cool. And, I, and, and the best fucking personality and vibe. Mm-hmm. I'm just kind of like, yeah, man, let's do this. It's great. Mm-hmm. Then you'll get... You'll get that guy for a while, and then Lisa Love goes on a tour, and you got to get the third stringer, <laughs> and they're like fucking slowing down or yeah. dragging, or they don't like the music, yeah. so they're just doing it for the money, and you're like, ah, <laughs> that is, and, and so 
you know every time you get a different drummer, it's totally different. Yep, hundred percent. Totally, man. Hundred percent. Yeah, and and even if you're running tracks and 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 click and stuff, you know the feel is still going to be totally different. Totally. And, and so that's the ch- most challenging part about all these scenarios I've been in. You know, like whether it's Volta or M83 or Miley Cyrus or the 1975 or Juliet Lewis or this Weezer thing I just did. Like you have to step in and and not emulate the person's style because you're never going to be able to do that right but fit in enough to where you're where you're serving the music you're playing the parts right like according to the records which is what i always try to do um and you're not uh you're not so you're not distracting you know you want to you want to slide in there play the music the, the way it's supposed to be played and and not have someone go oh wow like the the drummer you know like which there's a time and a place for that, but it's it's all about the music, like at at the end of the day. So it's but but trying to approximate all these different people's styles uh, across all these different like genres is is tough. You have to be a chameleon. I think one of the real problems I would have with drummers is they would just really half-ass. They would learn kind of <laughs> the stuff, you know. And then you're just going like, hey, you, you got the record down, right? You listen to the record. Oh, yeah, man, I got that. <laughs> and then, you know, you go to rehearse and you're like, this guy doesn't even know. <laughs> Which one's that again? <laughs> yeah. How, how's that go? You know, and look, well, I can sing you the beginning like, you know, da da da. And they go, oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> but these guys were just like, they're just, they're doing too many gigs. Yep. They, they fucking. They're just like, I got to make some more money. I got to make yep. some more money, which I get it. You got to make money. Sure. And then they might not be into it. Mm-hmm. So when you get the dudes that are fucking great, you realize they're not going to be around because big money is going to, yep. the big machine is going to grab them. Yep. And they're going to be, and, and rightfully so. Yeah. You know, exactly. be out on tour. Yeah. You know? Well, it's, it's a different, I mean, with drumming, like, you know, you can play like sort of the, the you know, two and four. Bass, yeah, bass, it. yeah, totally. Which yeah. is different than any other instrument. Like guitar, you know? you're like, dude, you, you, you didn't fucking play the lead, right? Or you, you didn't even play the riff. Yeah, you're exactly. just cowboy coordinate. G C A. Yeah, you can't really bullshit it in the same way with other instruments. But uh, there's a lot of drummers out there bullshitting. It. Sure. Yeah. Hundred percent, man. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, it's been uh, it's been a wild interesting ride for sure how'd that killer be killed uh come come about that's fucking great troy is a god to me yeah i mean i love troy yeah he's a great dude um greg and i were friends for a long time and him and max had been talking about doing something and uh and then he was and then he showed max that that drum cam video of me and he was like okay great and then we ended up doing that record with my buddy josh wilbur um and uh yeah i'm really proud of that record it was it was uh for something that we all like i mean i didn't know what the vocals were going to be when i tracked that record because they weren't written yet so uh you know being able to work having three singers in one band yeah that's a lot Uh, it's it's cool though yeah yeah yeah. it It works it's it's kiss yeah Yeah, it it worked so mastodon yeah, one totally. of the best. Totally, they're probably the best at it now. They're great. Yeah, I oh, love all those guys fuck. too. They're such great dudes. Yeah. So for how like that could have gone, um, for I'm really proud with. I'm really proud of that record. I think it turned out great. Yeah. When you were young, what was the first kit you got? I had a CB700 Max M A X X. It was like a three hundred dollar kit I got out of the paper. And I beat the shit out of that thing, man. Like, oh my God. <laughs> I had that till, till I was like maybe 15 or 16. Yeah. And I just beat the brakes off that thing, dude. It was fucked up. <laughs> uh, and then I got like a, a Rockstar D, Tama Rockstar DX, kind of like a white sort of shitty version of Lars's kit, the two oh, bass yeah. drums. Yeah, yeah. And then where, had, where were you buying shit? Like bananas at large? Or? Dude, it's so funny, man. Uh, Zone Music. Oh, Zone! Yeah. Oh, fuck yeah, Zone! <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. Zone Music cornered the market because yeah. they, 
It was weird. They were a little shack, yep. and then they moved. They got, yep. and then they moved over to the next little shack. <laughs> yeah. And next thing you know, they're like three shacks. Yeah. Well, there was nothing else. The only other music store was Stars in yeah. Santa Rosa. Yeah, and that was bomb. That place sucked too. Yeah. So, but yes, yeah, zone so, music. Yeah, so it's still it's still there. I don't know Is if it? they call it. They don't call it Zone anymore. It's called something else. Uh, yeah. But it's a lot of like consignment stuff. I think zone music. Yeah, so I mean there great. was not, there wasn't really any yeah, other no. places. Bananas you know? was like yeah, in Marin, right. and that was kind of like. Yep. And then you would go to Guitar Center. Yep. In, you know, in the I remember, city. I remember it was like a big deal to like drive down to San Francisco and go to Guitar Center. Totally. It was so funny. Yeah. The other place I would go to a lot was. Um, a drummer's tradition in San Rafael. I don't what know if was it? Ever, it's called the Drummer's Tradition. I don't know that one. Yeah, it's a really rad vintage shop. Uh, my buddy Rob owns it. Has wow. owned it for a long time in San Rafael. Um, really cool vintage stuff. It's a great. Every time I go up to the bay, I try to visit him because it's a great, great. Oh, that's store. cool. Yeah, that place zone is rad. Music. Yeah, zone, <laughs> dude. It's so, so funny. at what point do you get like a really great pro kit? That's a good question. You know, I used to um, I used to tell people to get. I remember there was this kid I was teaching years ago, like ten years ago, and her parents were pretty wealthy. And I was like, you know what? If you just get this DW kit, and, and you know, you'll never have to get another kit. Like, you know, so in the long run, you'll save money. But then she like didn't take it seriously, and they had to like sell it. You know, yeah. and so it's like I changed my mind after a while because if you get a total piece of shit, you're like okay, well, let me learn what I'm doing. And then if you stick with it, then you upgrade a little bit and you're like, oh, wow, I can really appreciate the differences between totally, this piece of shit totally. and something that's marginally better. And then you work your way up. And by the time you get to a really nice kit, you're able to really, it's like watches oh, or yeah. cars. You know? You're yeah. able to like really appreciate what you just spent a bunch of money on. Well, it's like, you know, the first guitar I got, the fucking strings were eight miles off the thing, <laughs> and it was a, a nylon string. <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't fucking know. Sure. I just, I'm, I'm down there trying to learn Hell's Bells, <laughs> you know, or uh, actually it was Highway to Hell. I, I, I couldn't even press the strings down. Sure. And then you get a, a, a copy guitar, like at the Sebastopol flea market. That guy used to sell <laughs> equipment up there. There was a guy out there. That's amazing. Yeah. Seville's and... And Memphis, those were the two co copy guitars. Right. I go, dude, I got a Memphis Les Paul. And people are like, those suck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's hilarious. And then you start, well, by the time you get a Gibson or a Fender, you're like, oh, my God. Yeah. And, and, you, and you really, it's like, you know, doing comedy, just doing open mics. And you do a real show. You're like, oh, there's people here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fuck, these jokes <laughs> These jokes might work. <laughs> exactly. You yeah. Know? You work your way up and then you are able to appreciate. Yeah. It's the, you know, it's like a car, you know, I mean, like, like my, my Barracuda, you know, like, yeah. like I got that when I was 15 out of the classifieds in Sebastopol. Oh, you said that's your fucking still got that. huh? Yeah. 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 You remember yeah. like I was telling people, I don't think people understand, but I grew up in the seventies and the eighties and those cars were like a thousand dollars and they were everywhere. And that's just what you got and drove because to the, school. Because the oil crisis. Yeah, yeah, and they were just no money, and you know you could, you're just out burning out and drinking and driving, and you know, and <laughs> and, and and going to kegger parties. Yeah. In the in the Santa Rosa Hills, you know, <laughs> or out in fucking Guerneville. Oh Russian man. River kegger party. Dude, you amazing. ever play the River Theater? No, but oh. I've I've been out there though. Oh, of it's course. the best. Yeah. <laughs> How about Jay's amusement with the go karts? Oh man, I totally forgot that place even existed. Dude, Jay's amusement. Wow, there's man. no way that's still there. It just closed, I oh, guess, recently. Wow. I shot a video there. I told Burr the story. We we're on the Scrambler, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, the, the guy, like, I'm shooting a music video there, just getting to pick up. And the guy puts, he starts the ride and he's, we're, we're shooting it. And, I, and I'm like, on it. And then I'm like, where the fuck is this guy? We're done with the shot. And he's over making out with his girlfriend. That's like his, hilarious. Probably his first girlfriend. I'm on this thing for like eight minutes. <laughs> like, what the fuck? You're going to throw up everywhere? Dude, the scrambler for eight minutes, oh, man. Dude. Fuck. That's so funny, man. So then what kit do you get? Oh, well, I mean, dude. Well, it's a good question. I mean, I tell everyone to get like, if you want to get a new kit, <clears throat> like DW has this lower line called PDP, it used to be called Pacific. They make these wood hoop kits that you oh, can get oh, for like a thousand dollars. They sell. Remember Aots? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, dude. Yeah, 
fucking great. Those were amazing drums. Come on, that was just Cameron's, yeah, that Cameron's yeah. kit, man. Yep. He, he I would put per- that guy on the map. I would perv out on that ad he did oh. with the fade, the kit with the fade. Oh, my God. Now he's got, like, Yamaha with the rings. It yeah. looks just like an AI. Yeah, he's been playing Yamaha for a I long time. I went to time. the fucking NAMM show. I told this story on some other drummer, mm-hmm. and the old man was standing there, and there's an AOT booth. This is, like, five years ago. And I'm like, oh, fucking Aeon. I felt, look, I kind of got goosebumps. <laughs> I kind of felt bad for him because he was a king for a while. Sure. And I was like, oh, dude, man, I want to get you on the podcast. I love, mm-hmm. I lo- you know, you yeah. just. Because Matt really was like the one that told me, you know, other than like fucking, you know, because you watch the band and you watch uh, fucking uh, Levon. He's got mm, those old wood yep, hoops and shit. Yep, and that was yeah. the only guy I ever saw that had that stuff. Yeah, those old Ludwigs from like the 40s, yeah. 30s and 40s. Yeah. And then Matt had them and he was like, well, the wood hoops just make this thing sing, you mm-hmm. know? And uh, and Aot was it, you know? Yeah, no one was doing that back then. That's what no. put them on the on the map in like a really high end high end way. And now it's much more common. Like, yeah, this is an entry-level kit that does it, you know? But back then, no one did it. Yeah. I can't even tell you how many hours I spent on, like, the kit configurator on the AOT website. Like, in, I don't know, I guess I was in high school. But, yeah, just, like, perving out on those kits. It'd be great to get, like, a used, you know, quote-unquote vintage one from the 90s. Yeah, yeah. Well, the problem, I've owned a bunch. I mean, dude, I... You you had some? We both collect. Yeah, on tons of shit. So I've owned a bunch of their snares, and they're great. But the problem with the wood hoops for the snares is you, they just crack eventually because oh. you're doing rim shots or whatever. And the way the lugs were designed, like it's hard to explain without visually showing you. But the way the lugs were designed, they're overly complicated and they're kind of a bit of a pain in the ass. Yeah. But um. But yeah, man. And then also like Greg Keplinger, who made Matt a bunch of his snare drums. He did some drums with a yacht. I have a bunch of Greg's drums that he's made me. He's a huge part of Matt's. Wow. Sound. Um, like all those Soundgarden records are all Keplinger snares. Um, you should have Keplinger on, man. He's amazing. Oh, He's mine. a total freak. That'd be great. He's Who's great. that guy making drums over in Silver Lake? Uh, in Silver Lake? Yeah, I think someone's making drums no, over there. I don't know. It's possible. There's yeah. so many There's so many up-and-coming people now. Yeah, I don't know. Right. But, uh, what are you playing? Uh, DW. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I came I- out with a snare drum a few years ago. Uh, it's like a bell bronze uh, uh, sort of homage to the Tom of Bell Brass. It's like a super famous snare drum. So I came out with my own version of it. Wow. That's, that I'm super stoked on. I just has got a room out there. He does. He's got a, he's got a, well, it depends kind of when you catch him. Uh, I think he's back up there now. He was in Japan for a while with the pandemic and stuff. But yeah, I mean, he's got a gigantic drum set that's just like in a room there. It's funny, like when I first, I mean, I can't even tell you how many hours I spent watching videos of him when I was a kid. I mean. Oh, same with the drummer in my band. He would uh, drive me crazy. He just go in the room. It's all. <laughs> and then the drummer of a band, he fucking made this like rubber pad in his car while he's driving. He's like, oh my, da, 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 oh my da. god, oh my god, oh, I've never done that. But, oh. but yeah, the thing about Bozio is he, you know, he has this gig- he's had this gigantic drum kit for years now, where he's like, you know, stretching the the possibilities of the instrument, which is incredible. Um, and, but like the problem is, is people, especially kids these days, they don't realize that he played you know, with missing persons and Zappa and all these like bands and, um, and his feel was like insane. Yeah. I mean, did you watch that, um, that, uh, what's that famous festival? The I went to that. I saw him Us oh, festival. Yes. 83. Dude, I saw man. that concert, dude. And, 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 and I was like, this guy's insane. Dude, the whole band was just dr- destroying. It, it's unbelievable to think about that band, what they were, and then they had this radio hit, you know, walking in L.A. Yeah. But that, uh, I think it's called M Bop or N Music. Uh, spring Sh- Spring Sessions M, the record. The first record, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just insane, like what they did. Super unique. They were way like Terry Bozio was like inventing triggers, like yeah. no one had really oh, yeah. like done that before. Yeah. So like he's such. I mean, he's one of my heroes, man. Like. You ever meet him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he yeah, like because Don Lombardi, who does, uh, who owns DW, used to own DW. Um, now he, his son does. Um, he has this drum channel thing, which is like an online education resource. They have a big studio up there, and Terry, when it first started, was hosting it. Yeah. So they were like, "Why don't you come up here and you'll do the show with Terry?" And so Terry's like interviewing me on the show, and I was like, "This is." fucking ridiculous you know, like, Terry's like so how's it going Dave I'm like what the fuck this is 
nuts. I've been trying to get him on the show for 10 years. I talked to his son. I oh, get, really? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Is he like a hermit? Like, you don't see the guy out? Yeah, I mean, he, well, I think he's he's mostly up up sort of in, I don't know, actually, to be honest, but I know right. he was in Japan for a while, and then he's kind of up towards the DW area, I think. But Yeah, Ventura. Yeah. I'm dying to have him on oh. just because I've had all the, a bunch of Zappa people He's so on. cool, man. He's yeah. the greatest. I remember, like, I had um, uh, Dweezil call me to do the Zappa play Zappa thing years ago. And it was right when Stacy called me to do the, the Miley thing. Right. And, uh, and yeah, I'm a huge Zappa fan. And, um, so I was like, shit, what am I going to do? And I called Terry and I was like, I was like, man, I don't, what do you think? You know? And he was like, well, how long do you have to practice? You know? And I was like, I, I was like, Oh, you know, like uh, th- whatever this long. And he was like, well, I think if you spent like three hours a day practicing like for a few months, you'd be, you'd be fine. And I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to do Miley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the Miley check's got to be way bigger. Yeah, totally, yeah. totally. Also, like, Joe Travers does uh, the, Dude, the Zabina. Dude, he is and, amazing. And he's great, man, and he, it's in his goddamn blood. Dude, I didn't know who he was, yeah. like, a long time ago, yeah. and I remember seeing some Zappa thing at the Spud, like, 12 years ago yeah and i remember being like who the fuck is this guy i didn't know he was the vault meister i didn't know any of that shit right he was just some fucking punk kid and i'm watching him and i'm like and he was like quoting different drummers from different eras like in their parts yeah he's like i'm gonna play this when Vinny played it and then i'm gonna play this like where terry played it i'm gonna play it like this like chester thompson played it and he's like this encyclopedia and i was like Lord, how yeah. amazing he is! <laughs> yeah, he he is. is so talk about underrated. I just saw man. him uh, like three weeks ago Ugh. at the whiskey. Dude, who is he I playing went, with? They, they got the Zappa. Oh, band. great! Oh, yeah, but they got a bunch of original people. Dude, it's all the guys. You got Mike Keneally, Tunis. You know, Dude, Scott Tunis is fucking amazing. Oh, you got White. Uh, the, the, it's the dudes, man. That would be a different thing. If yeah, someone called like, me to do something like that, yeah, I'd be like, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's it. You know, it would yeah. be tough to do, too, because you got Scott there. Wrong. <laughs> wrong. You're playing it wrong. Not only is he like such a badass player, but yeah. his stage presence is so great. He was in my band. Oh, yeah, dude, he played in my in, band. That's insane. It's crazy, dude. Yeah, yeah, I've watched that, that video from the early 80s. Um, I can't remember what it's called. But I watched that video from the early days with Chad Wackerman and yeah, yeah. Um, the, I can't remember the sax player with the short shorts. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> the video. keyboard player, sax yeah. player. I, I watched that video so many times, dude. It's 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 unbelievable. What were you listening to? Like, uh, were you just standard up there when you're first getting into it of like ACDC and 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 at what point do you? Is it like the one video with Lars? What starts, you know, what? Because I think Lars gets a bad rap. Yep. And I think that, you know, of course, I think for me, Dave Lombardo, greatest of all time because he had swing. Mm -hmm. Still, not all time. He's still playing. He's a testament. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, I mean, Lars, it's so weird how somebody could just shit on a guy so much and I just think that he's fucking fantastic, you know, as well, far as like he was playing weird shit <laughs> that he didn't he didn't know how to play. Right. So you wouldn't do that if you knew the rules. Right. Sure. You no, know? I totally agree with you. We were supposed to uh, Weezer was supposed to do a show in Spain. The last show of this run we just got back from we were supposed to open up for them and our jet had a fuel leak and we couldn't make the show at Fuck. the last dude it was such a bummer Brutal. yeah it was I a, just open for them you know and and it, like i mean to be around those yeah. guys is so mighty yeah it would have been would have been dumb even rivers was like man that would have been like a total bucket list thing even someone like that totally. who's like you know i mean he's like wearing ride the lightning shirts when we're playing these shows you know he's like a huge fan i mean so am i um i think the thing about lars is that those early records were st- the the I think it's just there's there was he got to a certain point and from what I've heard or read he was like yeah everyone's just getting so fast now I just gave up. I remember that. He once he got to the Black album. Yeah. He was like and, and James said that too. We got yeah. to the Black album and like what what are we going to do? Go faster and faster. Uh, there, there's there's it's just it's at the fastest. Well, you know? and people shit on the black album too, and it's that's a masterpiece. One of, that's one of my favorite records of I don't all give time. A fuck what anybody says, 
Yeah, they're just idiots. I completely you know? agree. Well, like it's just the me- songwriting. Yeah, the, and the, the, the intensity, t- the tones. What are you saying? Sad but true is not great. Wherever I may roam. Yeah. Holier than thou. Yeah. You're saying those. Well, the thing about the thing about Lars is so great is is all of his um, isms. You know, like he has so many interesting, um, not just quirks, but like. You know, if you go do 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 ba and you hit a crash and a snare at, on two or four at the same time, everyone goes, "Oh yeah, that's a Lars thing." You know, like there's all these things that are so instrumental in the structures of the songs, and also like we were, like I said earlier, we were covering Inner Sandman on this on this run, and you know, I've heard that song thousands of times, but like when I went to actually chart it out, I was like, "This song is super fucked up." Like, <laughs> Like, like the form and like how parts come in and out. It's like, this makes no fucking sense at all. Yeah. Like, that's but, what I love about it. Yeah. yeah. But, but it's not, but you would never, never, know. never notice, which yeah. I think that's the hallmark of so many genius bands, like the Beatles or whatever. Right. Like, um, uh, or Soundgarden. I mean, Matt is a master of taking like super fucking weird parts and making them sound totally normal and like funky, you know? Oh, that beat on Wooden Jesus? Come on, man. <laughs> Jesus Christ like, pose? No, Wooden Jesus on the Temple of the Dog. Right oh, there. yeah. Like, it turns in, it around and shit. You're I like, never what? got into Temple of the Dog like, as much. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. It's just kind of like, what the fuck? Yeah. yeah oh, I got to play that. I'm, that's uh, what I'm saying, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I love Matt's playing. He's a he's I a fucking genius. love Matt. Yeah. But his feel is amazing. And, and Lars's feel on, on the Black Elm is incredible. Um, but also what you were talking about earlier with like Lombardo, like having like a swing, like to me, I just heard it, but you hear about this Pantera thing. Yeah, I did. I'm so bummed, dude. That's one of my favorite bands of all time. And to, to tell me, yeah. And yeah. to me, like, I mean, burn, I talk about this shit all the time. Cause when we first started hanging out, yeah. I was like, okay, you really love ACDC. Like clearly I was like, have you ever checked out Pantera? And he's right. like, not really. And I was like, dude, so I made him start listening to Pantera. Yeah, and, and then like, he went to Meshuggah. Yeah, exactly. I took him to the Meshuggah show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because that's the thing with, with, with Vinnie Paul and Am with Haka from Meshuggah. Those are the only two dudes, maybe Mario from Gojira as well, but those are like the only guys I can think of in heavy music who have great feel. Yeah. It's so rare to have that swing and bounce and Lombardo, funk. man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, sure. when you well, listen to Seasons in the Abyss record... That thing is like a bouncy groove yeah. rock record. Yeah. I mean, it's like... You know, it's like giddy up. Yep. You know? Yeah, it's like a horse... horse. Like when he plays Let There Be Rock with us, Yeah. he just fucking crushes that thing, man. He's so great. And he's and he's also just like... He's so talented. This is a conversation I have to have with so many people when I'm teaching is like you look at Lombardo and he's sitting on the ground right he's sitting on the floor his knees are up in his face he's yeah. leaned over everything's like looking at him like as far as like use goes is a fucking disaster but the thing i have to explain to so many people is i go yeah that's dave lombardo like he's totally gifted yeah. And he can make this shit happen in spite of the fact that he's sitting on the ground, his knees are in his face, his drum kit's all fucking set up all crazy. Like, because he's Dave Lombardo. If you try to copy that, you're going to end up in a fucking wheelchair. Well, I talked to Dave about it because we, uh, it's a great thing to talk about because my ex drummer, he'll be listening to this, I know it, and he's always like, ask him about injuries. Yeah. Like, what can't they play now at, at an older age? And Dave said, look, my kit looks wacky. I get it. But he goes, if you really look at me playing, everything's right here. So I'm not swinging my Mm -hmm. arm above my head. Mm -hmm. So I'm never going to have rotator cup issues and stuff. He said, it's all here. So that's how he says. Well, but the thing is, like, as far as I know, he's never had to look into how the body works and how you use it. Like, that's kind of the thing that I specialize in with helping these guys that have been playing for a long time who do end up eventually hurting themselves. And the thing is, like, those aren't, like, that's not the type, it's not like you're a pitcher or a tennis player. Those aren't the kind of injuries you get playing drums. What you get is your back blowing out. Lower back. Yeah. And if you're you're sitting where your pelvis is below your knees, your lower back is just, 
it's going to happen eventually. So yeah. that's so that's a perfect sort of slice of how people end up being in trouble is is there, you know, I remember seeing them do the Big Four show in San Bernardino like 10 years ago whenever that was and he's like wearing a Hawaiian shirt and he's like, "Hey, what's up? Oh, we're going on stage like whatever." And just like goes like just like killing it. No warming up or anything. Yeah, yeah. Cuz he's a freak, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and then he gets off stage like, "Oh, hey, what's up, Dave? You want some wine?" Like just like whatever, you know, cuz he's a freak. Yeah. Um and so you can do that until you can't, you know, right. and, and, and then you end up like Phil Collins, you know, which is like such a tragedy. Man, you know? that's brutal, right? Yeah. Like, Dude. Miley from Rival Sons, I mm-hmm. saw he was giving you compliments. Yeah. At what point do, because like I said, you played with great guys, but you're not a household name. At what point do like actual fucking star drummers start coming to you? This has got to be kind of surreal, right? Oh uh, yeah, well I've been doing that for a long time. Yeah, but I know, but yeah. I mean, just like, how does it happen? Like they just heard you're the guy, like, oh, he fixed my yeah. my hand movements were yeah. wrong. I mean, a lot of it is. I mean, with social media now, it's a lot more. Of course, yeah, it's a lot easier. But you know, it was a lot of it was word of mouth, and um, I mean, you know, when I was doing when I was on tour with Volta. Um, you know, we were doing that Big Day Out tour in Australia and um, Muse was doing it. And like Dom was just watching me on the side of the stage. And then after a few shows, he came up to me at like a party. He was just like, hey, man, like I, I heard you teach. I'd love to take some lessons. And it's just, you know, a lot of it's that, you know, people people see me play or it's word of mouth or so. And then and yeah, it's do you spe- you specialize in uh seating position and ergonomics and stuff like yeah. that, like body positioning. Yeah. Right? Like the, the, the closest thing I can sort of compare it to is Alexander technique. I don't know if you've ever, I heard don't know. Of that. What is that? Alexander technique is a, is a, um, it's a method invented by this guy, Frederick Matthias Alexander. Um, and he back in like the late 1800s, early 1900s, I think he started writing books around the 1910, 1920. Um, and he was a, um, uh, an actor. And so he, he had like a single man Shakespeare, play that he would do and so he was an orator so he would project his voice and he started losing his voice and so at the time the doctors are like oh yeah we'll just cut your vocal cords or throw some leeches on you or whatever the fuck because it's like way back oh yeah 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 and so he ended up um surrounding himself with, by with, uh, with mirrors in a room and observing himself and he just happened to be a complete genius and he came up with this whole method of of how to use the body and the mind the thing that was so genius about it is he realized that the mind and the body are inextricably intertwined and you can't separate the two um, so he came up with all these different concepts um, and he realized that I mean, you could spend the whole podcast talking about this, but, um, you know, basically you have your natural use of your body, which is how your body's designed to be used. So like if you watch a child squat, they squat perfectly or they leave at the head or they use themselves in a really healthy way um, versus, you know, being existing in modern day society with phones and computers and shitty chairs. Yeah. So you get compressed. No bad habits. Yeah. Yeah. So the habitual use of your body is your normal use of your body. So there's a huge discrepancy between your normal habitual use of your body and your natural use of your body, the way it was designed to be used. And so people don't understand that and they don't understand. It's not just like, Oh, well I'll just get my body to do this because the mind is so complex. A lot of times you will, you will, there's a concept called faulty sensory awareness. So I'm constantly filming and taking pictures of people with the posture stuff because I'm like, look, you're used to sitting down like this. So when I get you sitting like this, it feels like this. Oh yeah. And then I take pictures of them and I go, this is what you look like right now. And they go, no way (laughs) because it doesn't feel like that. So it gets, it gets really complex. So I was doing a lot of this stuff on my own because I'm, I'm a highly sensitive person. So a lot of this stuff was just, not like it came naturally to me. Um, and it was really the opposite of the way drums had been taught by all these sort of old school guys playing jazz or never playing music at all. And just being like, well, this makes sense to me on paper, but then never playing gigs. Yeah. So the problem was, is it was all literally backwards as far as I'm concerned. And so I've been doing things this way for a long time. And then I started studying Alexander technique with Jean-Louis Rodrigue at UCLA and Sandra Dager in the Bay area. And 
I was like, oh my God, someone already did this. This is what I've been doing, but it's like a whole thing already. Wow. And everything I've read, everything I've studied is just, to me, solid gold. Like when you read anything about golf or tennis or boxing or, or like or Bruce Lee, you know, it's you're always like, yep, that's it. Like, and that's the thing is what I do is I try to zoom out and, and look at the, the, the macro and everyone else is looking at the micro. And so I'm paying attention to sports psychology. You know, uh, I'm reading a book on sprinting, like running coaches, because it's all the same. It's all the same stuff. It's all fucking body movements yeah. and, and also repetitive motion. That's a, and, that, and that's a whole other thing. You totally. know, like when you have that much repetitive movement, you end up building up scar tissue in your muscles and your tendons and ligaments. Absolutely. No one takes care of that shit. Yeah. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's these sort of different spheres which all come into, in, into contact with each other. And, um, and you sort of have to, what I say is like zoom out to zoom in. And so, you know, like with Miley, like he's out there playing all these huge shows of Rival Sons. And like, that's the kind of person I like working with because you go, okay, this is what you want to do. And then they go out on tour and they're playing shows every night and it takes them a second to kind of get it. And then they go, holy shit, I got it. Like I'm in the heat of battle applying this stuff yeah. and I, here's the results to show no more that blisters it, on the hand, all that shit. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like the same thing. Like when you get your vocal stuff together, like if you're doing it the right way. Oh my God. When I fine. learned how to sing, it was unreal because I tell people you're not going to singing lessons to learn how to sing. You learn how to sing with longevity. You're learning how to sing every night you're not learning notes and keys and stuff because if you don't have that, you're not going to learn that. Right. You know, you can't, eh, like, <laughs> totally. uh, you just don't have it. Right. What you're learning at a singing lesson is how to sing for years and hours at a time. And, and fuck, I sang before in-ear monitors. I could probably sing for the next 40 years now with in-ear monitors because well, I didn't have that shit. Well, and that's, it's exactly the same thing, dude. Yeah. You know, like it's that, that's what I, what I do with people. And, yeah. and a lot of, um, like the thing with singing is, is like your instrument is your body. Yeah. That's the scariest. Yeah. Man. It's the scariest. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's, it's a whole other level, but it's yeah. all, it's all the same stuff, man. It's like the, 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 what I've said before is like, it's like how Tiger Woods has a swing coach. But yeah. I'm also Tiger Woods in a, in a way, you know. Right. I'm not Tiger Woods, but you know what I mean. Like, there's a lot of tennis tennis coaches or or, or or like golf coaches who are just like coaches, you know, and they're good at that, and that's fine. But like, I've also I can actually play, which I think is also what makes a difference. Is like, I know what it feels like to play at a very high level, and yeah. there's a certain level of knowledge that can only really come from that. You know, I understand the way I understand singing on anybody that I ever see and they want to they're like, how do you do that or whatever is I watch anybody that tries to do ACDC and then I know right away they're singing wrong. <laughs> just it doesn't matter what style you want to sing. I just watch you sing ACDC and it's the same with drumming. They tighten up everything in their neck. And their throat and their body is all tight. And they're like, hey, you've been in this time. And it's completely the opposite. But that's exactly it. Yeah. Everyone is trying to white knuckle it. And yeah. I have to get them to relax right. and let everything go so they can so they can use their body. It's exactly the totally. same thing. When you're all loose, you know, yep. like when I sing ACDZ, I'm totally loose. It's just it just comes out. Right. There's no tight neck. But the thing is, like, you are are sensitive in that way so right. for you you're just like yeah i'm just loose like what are all these people I doing had to learn that though but that's what i'm saying right, right. exactly right and so that's the same thing with drumming people are all tight they're they're punched oh, over there God. and oh. there was that time in the 90s where everybody would be hunched over and like it was this punk rock look oh yeah and you know like uh josh freeze who i fucking love and everything you know he, you watched him. He just fucking flowed. Yep. There, there was no tightness yep. or anything. You know, it's yep. like, uh, and everybody was trying to be Josh Freeze for a while. And I go, you're missing it. The guy's fucking just. Yep. He's having a good time. It's like, 
Yep. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's well, yeah. I mean, him. you know, everyone, Dave Grohl fucked up a lot of people. Oh, totally. Oh, like, oh, my God. Yeah, and Tommy Lee with the big uh, fucking swing. And you know what's funny, man? I never appreciated Tommy Lee until I started hanging out with Burr. Yeah. And Burr was like, man, check this, check out this video. And I was like, dude, his feel is fucking amazing yeah like yeah. because I was, I was born in 84 oh so yeah like you, you know the devil yeah <laughs> or, so that was 84 what is that the big album or whatever yeah i don't it was, i was like after it was, it was before my time you know yeah. so like born in 84 <laughs> stepping out of high school hilarious <laughs> you missed it dave <laughs> i definitely missed some of the good shit in yeah, the yeah, 80s for yeah. sure but yeah man so that's you know that's that's what i do with these people it's the exact same thing and uh People need it, man. They really, really need it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, drums are the most brutal, other than singing that yeah. you could you could have. That's just all there is to it. Yeah, and it starts brutal from the day one. <laughs> you have to carry all this fucking bullshit. Totally. So right away, you gotta have some shit car that chicks don't <laughs> dig. You know, some fucking <laughs> dumb. Uh, you know, Dotson wagon. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and and as soon as as soon as you're done. Your ass is all wet <laughs> <coughs> while the rest of the band's at the bar. You know, they're like, yeah, good gig. Your ass is wet. Your shirt, you got fucking shit to tear down. Yeah, dude, oh. it sucks. You and know? then you got that snare drum at your goddamn ear all night. Pow, pow, pow. Yeah, especially mine. They're really loud. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, dude, people don't people yeah. don't get it, man, you know? But, Who, uh, who's in uh, Weezer? Uh, like, what happened to the drummer? Uh, he just had some. He had some stuff where he couldn't do it. You know. Oh, one of those. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, because I remember for a while the drummer wanted to play guitar. Yeah. So ten years ago, Pat, because Pat's an amazing guitar player. I really like Pat a lot. We get along really well. He uh, he was like, yeah, I think I'm going to play guitar. And so River stopped playing guitar and just sang. Right. And like ran around like a fucking crazy that. He was person. Like front man. Yeah. 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 It was cool. Um, and then they got Josh to play drums and they did that for a whole album cycle. And it was like a cool, weird experiment that they did. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I told them after this run, I was like, hey, look, if you guys ever want to do that again, let me know. Like, yeah, I'm totally down because yeah. they're we they were great guys. The music's super fun. Shows were bass huge. players killer. The newer one, yeah, Scott. Ooh, yeah, man. Scott's. Great. I saw him at uh, Amoeba like three years ago. Oh wow. Woo. Yeah, fuck. yeah. Smoker. Scott's great. Yeah. yeah, we 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 were able to to um, click yeah. really really well together. Yeah, and that guitar player is great. Mm -hmm. The one the gun 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 gun. Yeah, yeah. yeah I just yeah. call him Hash Pipe. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I don't yeah. know his name. What Brian. a dick I am! But man, yeah, that yeah. guy's like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Hash Pipe is the greatest rock song. It's a great man. song. <laughs> Rivers is brilliant, man. He's, he's fucking great, yeah, man. And apparently, he's like Prince. He's just got like a thousand songs and a hard drive. You know, like, he's so cool, man. Yeah, he's great, it. man. I really like him a lot. What point do you get into watches? Because uh, you and I, we bonded over. Uh, most of my people that I've uh, met. Uh, around LA, it was over watches or music sure. or or comedy. Sure, you know? yeah, yeah. And now architecture. You and I, yeah. we run into each other at the same open houses. <laughs> We're like, here's a house we can't afford. <laughs> I know, Every totally. house we go to, we can't afford. I know, we used to be able to. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, uh, well, yeah, we got a couple things. We got the comedy shit, the cars, yeah. the watches, the music. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, well, my dad collected watches, so but I was never really into it. But it was always like this sort of thing floating around, and then um, I don't know, three four years ago, I started kind of getting into it. I don't really know what what spurred it on. I think just I don't know. I think I've probably owned every snare drum ever made, so yeah, I got to yeah, a point yeah, where I was exactly, like, yeah, exactly. okay. And then like you read these old car mags, and they're like, so this is one of three with this, and it's just like this isn't going anywhere. Yeah, you know, like yeah. you know, it's so you know maybe that had something to do with it. But my dad had a bunch of um, he was really into like the fifties and sixties, like Hamilton Electric stuff, like the Venturas and funky. My dad likes weird stuff, so. Um, and he had, uh, he had a lot of watches that he gave me a few years ago and I got a lot of them fixed up and, you know, there was a Patek Disco Volante, like an early sixties, which is a really beautiful watch. And then he had a, a Rolex Zephyr, 
Oh, wow. Yeah, like the Rose Gold. Yep. Um, and then that Mark II Speedmaster. And what is that, a 70s? 70, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, That's an underrated watch. I think so, too. Yeah, man. Kevin Christie and I are like, this thing's going to pop one day. I think so. You know what it is? I call it the 912 of Porsche <laughs> uh, or the 924, yeah. where everybody's like, I can't afford a 911 now. Right. Ooh, what are these? Yeah, totally. Yeah, and then those are going to go through the fucking roof, you yeah. know? I, and I really like the one that has the day and the date, the Mark III. Uh, three or four one of the it looks exactly the same but it has day and uh, date because i think the mark three and four the case started getting a little weird it's exact uh, uh, exact in the mark one but it has a day and a date i'll show it to oh, you interesting okay yeah yeah so i i inherited those watches from my dad and then your dad passed away no no he's still around oh. he was just like i'm not wearing these right. like they're sitting in a safe like what am i doing like you may as well have them now and so you know i sold ones that like i didn't need or were kind of redundant um and then i was like you know i want to get my own stuff so i so i started off the first real i got a, i got like an oyster perpetual and then i got like a a, a, a date and then the first real watch i got was a 18038, like a gold day date bark. Great. With, oh, bark dial. Rad. Yeah, I was really into the bark because <laughs> it was different. I you love know? those. It's just like well, the pro I call it the Bigfoot. You know, uh, uh, the, um, what's his name? The dude at HQ Milton. Yeah. Um, yeah, he said you went in there. Yeah. He called me up and said you went in there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because I showed up and he was like, hey, I did some research. Kind of, your friends are Dean, right? And I was yeah. like, oh, yeah. He's like, okay, we're cool. I yeah. know because he doesn't let anybody in. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. So I was driving up to the Bay Area. I think to get the watches actually uh, for my dad. And I just got that, that bark day date and I was perving out for so long and I finally got it and it was like mint and I'm driving up there. I'm talking to brain on the phone and I looked down at the watch. I'm like, motherfucker. And I dinged one of the center links, like right where the oh, yeah. bark was yeah. and because it's bark. You could just see it. Yeah. I, I could see it. Right. And I was like, I got to get rid of this fucking thing. Oh. I was like, I can't fucking have, I can't have this anymore. Cause yeah. it was going to be like my daily, which I didn't know at the time. That's like, right. I can't wear a gold bark day date every day. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, I was driving up to the, to the bay and I hit up Scott. And I traded him for, uh, I mean, it was, he just basically like coughed it out and it yeah. was gone. It wasn't a big deal. But for me, I was just like, this is going to drive me crazy because I'm so OCD. I'm the same way. Yeah. And so, now I got a guy that uh, can fix anything. Oh, cool. Bo Gore at LA Watchworks. I've heard of them. Dude. Yeah. So the Instagram's insane. Oh, yeah. yeah. So now no fears ever oh, again. Cool. So I traded him that for a, for a, uh, for a Coke GMT and then. I don't know. Six months later, I traded in the Coke GMT plus some cash for this Daytona. Oh yeah, is that a Zenith or? A I wish. No, it's yeah. 2007. With oh great, though. Yeah. I still love the Daytona movement. Yeah. I mean yeah. the Rolex movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean it's actually better than the Zenith. Right. But the it's Zenith just is just worth discontinued. More. Yeah. yeah. But you know, did you uh, prefer black dial over white? Yeah, I'm all, I'm kind of more of a black dial guy. Right. And uh, Brain has one of these, and I and uh, and I was like, oh man, like that's the shit. Yeah. So I got this, and then recently I got um, a Tridor Day Date. I think I showed it to you when Burr was oh, doing yeah. it for him. Yeah, so, that's yeah. right. Yeah. I just like weird shit. Like I've gone into a few watch shops with that watch on, and they don't even know what it is. Yeah. They're like, wait, what is that? I'm like, it's a Tridor. <laughs> it has the rose gold, the white gold, the yellow gold. They're yeah. like, I don't even know what that is. And I know. You told that. me you were looking for that, and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. I got that, which was like something I was really after. And, and you know, it's a fun thing. And the way the market's been, it's a fun investment. Well, and like crazy. Yeah. And like I've bought and sold stuff where I've either made a little bit of money or broke even or whatever. And it's like, oh, I'll get that. And I'll sell this. It's like it's a fun thing to do. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. for now. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a it's definitely fantastic. And and, you know, I think, uh, you know, of course, I've got into watches because of Bond. I love James Bond. Oh, interesting. I love the Rolex sub, no crown guard, big crown. Mm -hmm. And that was it for me, you know? But now I think that it's such a weird world with the Instagram. Look what I got that I'm into the cheaper stuff of the Omega and the Tudor. And they're just, they're really like uh, fucking cutting edge what Tudor's doing. It they really, did such a great job with the branding. It's fucking great, man. Yeah. And, and uh and i also like 
I'm back into the G-Shock world. Mayor <laughs> gave, me, may, gave me a G-Shock. Oh, cool. G-Shock, you know? Yeah. And I'll just fucking wear that, man. It's so, so great. Yeah, well, if John Mayer gave it to you, I'd wear it too. <laughs> yeah, what's the John Mayer model? It's really oh, oh, fucking cool, cool That's man. That's awesome. It, it's white. I'll show it to you. Yeah. And, you know, I like those G-Shocks that are also the square ones. Yeah. I got an orange one. Yeah. I was I was at a shop and the guy was, I was like, yeah, I'm a drummer. And he's like, you don't play with your watch on. I was like, no, not really. You know, and I was like, oh, you know, not really. And he's like, yeah, I mean, the only thing you could really wear if you were playing is like a G-Shock. You know, like, yeah, I don't believe that though. Really? Yeah, because, um, you know, they can take it. You talk to Bill Gore, he's like, yeah, they can take it. You think yeah. so? Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if I'm like teaching and I have to like illustrate something and I'll play something, like, yeah. I'm not going to take my watch off. Yeah, it's but if gonna... I'm like playing a show, I'm yeah, obviously it's not, not going to do wear anything it. to yeah. it. You know? Interesting. The only thing you don't want to do is put them through the fucking x ray at the airport, man. Don't do that, people. <clears throat> you can walk through the scanner. That's a lighter thing. Yeah. But that fucking one you put it through is like powerful. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know? totally. Also, your watch is running crazy slow. <laughs> yeah, that's fucking wild. <laughs> what do you got uh, coming up? Do you got any gigs or the Weezer thing just rolled? Yeah, we th- that was the that was it for the Weezer thing as far as I know. Um, and uh, right now I'm just back to teaching. And where can people get a hold of you? Do you teach on Zoom? How yep. Does, yeah. yeah, I teach on Zoom a ton. Uh, and then I teach out of my studio in, in, in L.A. Where's um, your studio at? It's on the west side. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, and then you just, uh, the students come there. Yeah. And mm-hmm. how many days a week are you doing that? You know, I try to stack up like four days, pretty solid. Right. And then I'll have three days to just kind of do whatever I need to do. But yeah, people can hit me up on my website, just davielis.com or my Instagram. Give them the spelling real quick. Yeah. <laughs> E-L-I-T-C-H. Were you in uh, dr- drum, uh, drum, Modern Drummer Magazine? Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. What, what was that like? That had to be like crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was definitely like ticking off a box, you yeah. know, like for sure. Yeah. It was fun. I mean, you know, it just didn't. didn't Did they give you the cover? No, I wish. No, but you nice. were in it, though. Yeah, yeah. That's uh-huh. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's oh. um, still going. It, it, they have a new owner now, but um, but yeah, I mean, I think all magazines are kind of, you know. Yeah. So it was cool just to be like, okay, I got in here like while it's still around, you know. All my dreams came through, th- music dreams came through from comedy. Like I got in Guitar Player Magazine from really? comedy. Yeah, because I did the uh, bake show at the Baked Potato. <laughs> You know, that's uh, hilarious. Where you do comedy and then sing yeah, a yeah, song. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and guitar player was there reviewing it one night, and they're like, this fucking guy kills, you know? <laughs> and then I played, uh, or I didn't, Burr did the LA Forum. I yep. got to do that twice. Yeah, that's that was amazing. a dream. And yeah. never, never got to do it as a musician. Sure. And then Oakland Arena, dude. Yeah. Where right. I saw every show. Is that the Cow Palace? No, we that- did, I did that. We were going to do the Cow Palace, but the Oakland, where Golden State Warriors uh, played. Okay. But, you know, yeah, I saw yeah. Van Halen there, yeah, and Rage, and dude. Bruce Springsteen, totally. and Def Leppard and everybody <laughs> everybody there so that's amazing yeah you just keep going and your dreams come true and some other thing <laughs> yeah in some other <laughs> unprecedented unforeseen way yeah yeah well thanks for doing the show of course, dude. Of course and man. uh great to have you on finally yeah and get some uh lessons people out there <laughs> and f- learn how to play right now properly so you don't pick up these bad habits and just have a fucking shit form. Yeah, you know? no, you don't. So you're not in a fucking wheelchair when you yeah, get older. <laughs> exactly. Holy <laughs> shit! How's your ears? Mine are fried. Uh, they're okay. They're they're not they're not great, but they could definitely be worse. Yeah, yeah. I can, I'm gonna go. I'm about to start this tour, and I'm gonna go get. Uh, so I lost my pro earplugs. Uh, my um, what were they called? Molds. The Sonics or something? Oh, uh, Pro Sonics. Pro Sonic, yeah. yeah. I, I wore that. Wore this for years. They're kind of uh, like a, uh, like a weird uh, silicone yeah. or whatever. Uh-huh. Oh god, they're great. And then you yeah. have the filters. Yeah, you can block out five or yep. ten, pop in different filters. So I got to go get some new plugs, and um, fuck, it might be time for hearing aids. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, my right ear is. Just, I can hear fine here. Sure. But movies and shit. Wow. Like I love to go to the movies and when I go it's just like oh wow I just went to Top Gun and I was like I should have just thrown my money away <laughs>
Anytime there's a low scene, like, <laughs> oh, damn. You know how people sounded with the mask yeah, during yeah, the yeah, pandemic? Yeah. That's how everyone sounds to me always. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you come up in the 80s, dude. Fuck, Fucking monitors just, just shredding monitors your face. And side fills. And, oh. and then my Harley, the uh, oh. exhaust pipe was on oh, the right. Oh, yeah, that'll kill you. Yeah, it's fucked up. But, you know. <laughs> I don't regret it. Thanks, man. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes and my other podcast, The Grail, where I interview all kinds of tasty makers. Yes, check it out. Thank you.